Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Siemens EDA with Giant D'Souza. I'm going to talk today about how to use test data and combine that with other types of data in manufacturing. Giant Scan Diagnosis has been around for years, but it's getting a lot more complex in terms of now you have AI chips. You've got a lot more elements inside of those. What has to change in, inside of Scan Diagnosis? How do you see this evolving? So that's a great question, Ed. Scan Diagnosis has been around for a long time. Uh, designs have become a lot more complex, and the semiconductor manufacturing and processing has gotten tons more co complexity now in it than it ever had in, in the years past. On the horizon, there are, there are several new, more modern processing and manufacturing uh, that's coming, things like backside power that are, uh, that are problematic. And even in today's designs that are so complex, and with these new applications like in automotive or in data centers, we have to worry about things like silent data corruption or silent data errors. And we need to be able to find every single defect that's out there and kill it before it, it impacts our, our daily lives. So as, as a result of it, scan diagnosis is starting to play a larger and larger role in improving the yield of those semiconductor devices. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Giant, what are we looking at? So what we're looking at here is an illustration of three scan chains. So scan chain test, scan test is the de facto methodology to perform structural tests for digital ICs. And uh, it's been used for many years, for 20 plus years. And it's a very powerful technique to screen devices that are bad. Now, how this works generally is known data is shifted in, digital data is shifted in through these scan chains with every single clock pulse. Now, what is new with new methodologies and new designs and, and technology nodes is that sometimes you have defects also that exist in, in different parts of the design. But sometimes those defects can exist in the clock tree that drives these scan chains. So what happens is when you have a defect that, that's in the, in the clock tree, you, it manifests itself as multiple of these scan chains not functioning quite correctly. So imagine now, that you have a defect in this clock, somewhere in this clock tree, somewhere here in this clock tree. What ends up happening is you see two different scan chains. This one, scan chain A and scan chain B, that, that don't seem to shift data correctly through them. And when they don't shift data correctly through them, you basically are slowing down the whole system, right? Because everything is dependent upon all the signals getting to the end at the right time. Even worse than that, it's because you can't you can't even test the device properly because you're dependent on those scan chains shifting correctly to actually test and put the system in a known state. So you depend on those scan chains shifting correctly. And this is at time zero out of manufacturing, right? Because things may change as these are in use as well because the utilization is going to be higher on some of these than they used to be in the past. Absolutely right. I mean, it, it's it's at time zero. This is at, at, straight, at manufacturing test. You notice that some of these scan chains don't quite shift correctly. You can't actually perform all the tests that you were initially intending to, to test this device with. So what's new here? How does this change? So what happens now is we've been running, uh, we've been working on scan diagnosis for many years. And what happens is now, because these, these subtle defects and the clock tree can impact shifting to the scan chains, what the new technology we've developed can look for defects even in these clock trees. So imagine that if you had the, a defect here, in the past, you would assume that it's somewhere in scan chain A and a different defect in scan chain B that were causing both of them not to shift properly. So two different defects. But this new methodology that we've developed can look inside deep into these clock trees and find that and find this particular defect that explains why both those chains don't fail at exactly the same time. And that's one of the problems with silent data corruption too, right? Is that you have this sequence that may be very different from what you normally do, but you have to be able to track that down. Absolutely. So it, with things like silent data corruption and silent data errors, they're very small, uh, subtle defects that could appear in your device later on that could cause multiple of these things to happen where the data doesn't actually show up at the right time. So this could be one of those things that contribute to a silent data error or silent data corruption later on in, the device, in device production. There's also a lot more redundancy being built in here, not necessarily in the same places that it used to be. So it's now in the interconnects and the throughput for the data. How do you test that? 
So basically, one of the other things that we, we talk about in the scan diagnosis world is where the defect is occurring, whether it's in the back end of line or the front end of line. The back end of line is typically the interconnects, but scan cells themselves have grown in complexity so much that the defect could actually occur inside of the scan cell itself. So you might have a break in a path inside the scan cell that causes a reliability failure later on, or even at manufacturing tests early on, you notice that failure. So those are all things that we're aware of and we're working towards finding. We also have another new piece of technology called cell-aware chain diagnosis that looks specifically for defects inside of scan cells. So these are scan cells that are sometimes known as multi-bit flops, where you have a, a group of four or eight or 16 scan cells all put together in a standard cell block. As you start putting these together into advanced packages, how many scan cells are we actually talking about? Um, this, uh, with new modern designs, things like AI chips and GPUs and processors, I, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of flops in a single device, um, even up to close to a million uh, flip flops in, the, in a single device. How does this change as we start getting into some of these really large chips, particularly the AI chips that are going into data centers? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, t AI is all the rage uh, for good reason. And, um, and you know, uh, semiconductor devices are in every part of our life, right? From our phones to our cars to, uh, to data centers and AI is everywhere. With these modern devices, we need to be able to process things really quickly using the least amount of power possible. And part of what we rely on is not just design, but also on process, on process uh, manufacturing process, shrinking the node, further and further down. So today we're at um, three nanometers. The distance between two, two metal lines on a chip is three nanometers, just imagine that. And there's talk about going to two nanometers. And further still, on the horizon, we have um, new technologies like backside power down. And what that means is power is going to be delivered to the transistors, not from the top of the device to the transistors, but from the bottom of the transistor up to it. And this is a really exciting piece of technology, but with it comes a number of challenges, not just for, uh, not for testing, but for failure, fault isolation, failure analysis, and just pure manufacturing. And this has changed quite a bit because in the past, the EDA tools accounted for all that uh, uh, interference uh, noise before you got the backside power delivery. Now with the backside power delivery, how does that impact your tools? So this is another great question because in theory, EDA software typically kind of abstracts these things out to a point where the technology node is not the most important thing. It, it can work in different technology nodes. You want to scale across different technology nodes. The interesting challenge now for EDA is to enable semiconductor manufacturers, sem fabulous and foundries, to be able to detect defects like this, even in the case of, of backside power, in a way that they don't, because some tools that they, they relied on for fault isolation, like optical fault isolation, will soon be deprecated because you, the metallization at the backside of the, of the device prevents an optical fault isolation tool from actually being able to shine a light on a transistor. And they're relying on scan diagnosis, for example, to tell them exactly where that defect is. So that's the interesting challenge for us in scan diagnosis. Where does AI enter into this from the EDA side? So AI has played a role in EDA uh, for, for many years, especially in our team. We've used machine learning to look at defects like this and look at it in volume to, to build a Pareto of possible defect areas in, on the chip and defect types on the chip that could explain a large population of fa failing devices. And the diagnosis itself is complicated too, right? So how do you make sure that that's working properly? Like I mentioned, the challenge has been thrown down to the EDA space. And what we are, we are looking at is if we can tell you upfront, before you actually manufacture your device, how well scan diagnosis is going to work and tell you where in your design the, it might work well or not well, so you can actually fix it, that's, that's the next challenge for us. That's the next iteration. That's the next revolutionary change we can make to design. So you can actually change your design to guarantee good, high-quality diagnosis, regardless of that technology node. And this is what's going on in a lot of these complex designs anyway, right? Because a lot of these are one-off type designs for a very specific use. 
and they make changes as they go. So the idea is that with this new technology of diagnosis coverage that we've been working on, we will be able to see, people will be able to run this very quickly up front before they even sign off the chip or tape it out. So they can make iterative changes on the design to improve the diagnosability of that design before they get to actually fabricating the design. You mentioned machine learning. How does that fit into things like analytics and yield? So machine learning for many years has been used for analytics. Um, what, uh, what is happening today is because there's so much interaction between design and manufacturing and test, all these pieces of data have to come together in a cohesive manner so you can draw some really deep insights into the data. The, the reason why our chips are failing, why our yield is low, our yield really needs to improve, is not so much because of design or one thing in manufacturing or one thing in test. It's a, it's a confluence of all those little pieces. What we have been working on in, in, um, in our two, in scan diagnosis, using machine learning to look at volume diagnosis data to build a defect parado, that can then be fed into a yield analytics system, like a guided analytics system and a platform that can then be used to look at test insights and, and manufacturing insights all together in one place so that you can drive these insights and drive changes on yield very quickly. And all this is now moving into mission critical, safety critical type of application. So it's absolutely critical to get this right, correct? Uh, time is of the essence, right? With, uh, with yield, not only is time money, it's in mission critical devices like a, like a car or, uh, you know, or something going up into space. You do have to address these problems, detect, screen them and fix them before they occur especially if you know that something people's lives are going to be uh, beyond the line because of it. Giant D'Souza, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. Pleasure talking to you.